But it might. Oh, um, exactly. You see how well prepared I am. Right. Okay. Uh, welcome at sort of uh, the second day of uh, this workshop. Um, today's first speaker is Susan Goldemato, and the title of her talk is Insight into Car Knowledge and Gesture. Okay. Um, actually, wanted to think. No. Uh, yeah. yeah. Does this work? It works, right? Yeah. Okay. So I want you to think for a minute. If you had to create a language right now, how would you? What would you do? Since you've already got one, it's likely, or it's possible at least, that you might fashion this new language after the one you already have. But the question that I really want to address is what would happen if you didn't have a language? It would, seems like it would be a lot harder. It seems really hard, in fact, to think about inventing a language of sounds. So sitting down with somebody else who doesn't share your language and just exchanging sounds and have that work. But a language of hand movements could work quite well. And we actually already use our hands, we gesture a lot, we sort of interact non-verbally all the time. So maybe we could recruit this gestural system that we have to use as a language. The problem with that, though, is that the gestures we produce when we talk spontaneously actually don't look like language. And they don't look like language in a bunch of ways, but I want to focus on a couple of ways in which they don't look like language. One is that they don't combine with other gestures to create gesture sentences. They're big, long things, but they're not neatly called sentences. Moreover, the gestures themselves aren't a combination of parts, and they don't really look like a morphology, sort of building up of parts into a, a gesture. And finally, they aren't hierarchical. They don't really look like a hierarchical structure in any way at all. Okay. So to illustrate the differences between gestures that accompany speech and the gestures that I want to spend most of the time talking about today, I want to give you an example. This is a regular old kid. You're a kid from Philadelphia, which you'll be able to tell from her accent in a minute. She was asked by Jenna Iverson to just say how to get from one place in her school to another. Just listen to her and watch her gestures. Um, how to get to a couple places in the school building. Okay. Um, let's say we're starting from your classroom. Okay. How would you go from your classroom out to the school during the recess? For a um, Yes. Yeah. Um, for my teacher. Actually, is he's talking about a picture in a Richard Scarry picture book. I don't know if you know this, but there's a picture of a shovel stuck in sand. And what he does is he starts talking with the shovel. And he says, You shovel with the shovel. And then you use it when it snows, and you pull on your boots, and it, you, you, you use it outside, and it's kept downstairs. Like, it's a whole little story about the shovel. 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 Uh, uh, Understand, really, to be almost saying anything. 
in contrast to the original time I showed it to you, when it really felt like the gestures were right on the money, you really need speech in order to figure out what the money is. Now, if you listen to the deaf kid, there's a lot of speech going on here, too, and we're all trying to talk about what he's doing. But for me, actually, when I take out the speech, I can focus better on what he does and really figure out what his gestures are about. So here it goes.
Winchester. It's a toy grave. It's rubber. So he's not my tainted, but he's telling me that it's an old. The sound went out.
a circle handshake to represent the pin. And over time, and this is around three, three and a half, combines both of these gestures together in a way that isn't really necessary for communicative purposes, because it's pretty clear, this is the here and now, it's pretty clear what he's talking about in all instances. He does here is he does the penny gesture, points at the penny, and then points at himself. So there are two gestures now to refer to the penny. This is quick. So penny, point of So quick, penny, point the penny at So here's the iconic gesture for penny. He points at the penny and does itself. One more time. He does penny. Okay. So our hypothesis was that these, these combinations function like nominal constituents. What kind of evidence could we mount that they really are forming in unit? So this is the kind of evidence that we thought might be going to bear. If, if they really are forming a unit, they should behave as a single unit. And these gestures might require less effort to process when they're part of a nominal constituent than when they're not part of a nominal constituent. And that ought to have implications for sentence line. You might be able to have longer sentences if you have a nominal constituent in there. Those two gestures are not forming a nominal constituent. So this is the way we went about testing. So you have a sentence like, <coughs> point at, this is a real sentence in the kid. Point at the bird, bird, pedal. Okay, it's a picture of a bird riding a bicycle. So points at the bird, he does this, and pedals. And there are two ways that one could analyze those sentences, that sentence. You could either analyze it so that it's a chunk, where the point of the bird is the bird, uh, the bird it's sort of the bird pedals, okay, forming a chunk. Or you could analyze it as three separate gestures. This is a bird who moves up this category and it okay, So how do we distinguish between the two? We analyze these data um, and we use two different hypotheses. So what we did first is so we took all of the sentences that didn't have nominal constituents in them to try to establish what the kids' word length patterns were at this particular stage. So these kids are mostly two gesture kids. They're not, they don't do a lot of long sentences, but they do some. So we use the sentences that didn't have nominal constituents or have hypothetical nominal constituents in them to establish what the expected pattern ought to be for sentence length, sentence length for this kid at that period of time. Then we analyze the nominal constituent sentences under these two different hypotheses. One where it's forming a single unit and one where it's not. And we're just trying to see whether the observed data, how well does fit the expected data. Okay. So and here's the data for. This is the expected data, this is the pattern. Not a big surprise, two is more than three, so four is more than five, whatever. And if you look at the observed data, counting these bird thingy as a nominal constituent, as a single unit, it fits pretty well. Particularly when you look at it in relation to the other hypothesis. Again, these are the expected data, it goes down as, as I just showed you. But these are the observed data when you count it as three separate gestures rather than as a chunk. In fact, what it really means is that these sentences are longer than expected to be. The sentences with nominal constituents are longer than expected to be. You get mileage out of putting those two things together as a unit. So these data fit the, the expected pattern that these data suggesting that they really are in form of nominal constituent. There are some, so in fact, what we're trying to suggest, I'm not sure this is warranted when we talk about this, that this is a better description of the data for the little hierarchy than this is in a flat structure. There's a little bit of other evidence coming from the kinds of gestures that they produce that this is the right description. And the gest the these the iconic gesture and the point gestures in these nominal constituents are almost always contiguous. Now units don't have to be contiguous, they could certainly be displaced, but little kids tend not to be displaced things that are far apart. And these kids, it's not, I mean the kid will produce two points at the same object, and they are they are displaced. They are in fact often not contiguous. But when he points this does something like this, they're often right next to each other. Okay, so that suggests sort of unitness. The other reason to suggest that they might be in this case is that these two, the point of the little bird thing, um, play precisely the same kinds of semantic and syntactic roles as iconic and point gestures do when they're used alone. So when this penny and that combination is put in a sentence, it tends to be at the beginning of the sentence, just like the patient's word in the examples that I showed. So they occupy the same kinds of semantic roles, and it looks like it occupies the same kinds of roles in order, suggesting that it's a substituting. This unit is substituting for the same thing. Okay. 
So what I'm trying to suggest actually is these properties that I've just illustrated are what I've called resilient properties of language in the sense that you don't need a conventional language model in order to develop them. Um, the one that I just want to draw your attention to is generics. And that's going to, to link to the next talk because I think there is evidence that these kids develop generics, which I think is probably in line with what So um, the obvious question to ask is whether these kids are modeling their gesture systems after their hearing parents' gestures, because their hearing parents talk all the time, and of course they gesture, because everybody gestures. The short answer to this question is no. Let me very quickly show you why I think it's no. So here are the sentence structures. These kids have gestures. Their sentences are linguistically structured in a bunch of ways. Here's an illustration. Um, they sort of have an ergative pattern, literally speaking. Um, this is the probability with which a particular semantic element is going to be gestured in a sentence. These are very likely to produce a gesture for the patient. Like they're talking about eating a mouse eating cheese. Really likely to produce a gesture for the cheese. Not very likely to produce a gesture for the eating for the eater for the mouse. Okay. But it's not about the object. It's about the role. So if that mouse is running to his corner, it's an intransitive actor. They're very likely to produce a gesture for that. So patients and intransitive actors are treated alike and different from transitive actors in most of the cases. And that's from an ergative like pattern. So we look for that same pattern in the gestures that the mothers produce when they're talking to their kids. We analyze the gestures not looking at mother's speech at all, which is, of course, how the kid would analyze it in the speech. And what we find is jump. So the mothers <coughs> don't really look like their kids at all. They, there's no uniformity across the mothers. Um, the mother who shows the pattern best has the kid who shows the pattern least. And I think that this makes perfect sense because the moms are gesturing along with speech. Their gestures are forming a system with speech, not by itself. So they're marching to the beat of a different kind of system. Now what's sort of interesting is that um, these gestures, the mother's gestures are different from the kids, but the kids' gestures are the same as the kids' gestures halfway across the world, and different from the mother's gestures who are sitting in the same room. So the American kids' gestures look like more like the Chinese gestures than there's one Chinese kid who actually shows a different pattern. This is what might be a nominative accusative pattern in the sense that um, you have the, the patient is different from both kinds of actors. And that's at least a language like pattern, but it's different from one pattern. Okay. Um, in terms of word structure, morphological structure, we took the system for each kid, ran it roughshod across his mother to see what the fit would be. Not a surprise, the kid, I showed you this before, it fits better for the kid. It doesn't fit for the mom. It really doesn't fit very well for emotions. Um, for a head change, and it doesn't fit very well for emotions either. So whatever system the kid has devised, it's not really working for mom. Okay. And then finally, oh, um, we also looked across time. So mothers and kids interacting, and then over time, they're interacting every single day. Mom's going to get more like kids, kids are going to get more like moms. That's the way it should work. But in fact, what we did is we looked at David over a two-year period and tried to fit mother's head shapes, mother's motions, kids' system, head shape system and motion system. 50% fit at the beginning of the two-year period, 50% fit at the end. She's not moving anywhere. He's not moving toward her. He's not, she's not moving toward him. And I think it's because the gestures are really different. Hers are part of the gesture speech system. He is armed. I think that's why that happens, although it's sort of surprising. Final point is this hierarchical structure. We looked at mom's gestures. We can find even one instance where she did something like this. Not even one. There's just not any evidence. She'll point like this, she'll do something like this occasionally, but she never, ever, ever combines it. So what this suggests is that these resilient, resilient properties are certainly not inevitable in the manual modality. I mean, one might think, oh god, every time you pick up your hands, out will come these properties. It doesn't have to, because it doesn't come out from others. And then, of course, it also suggests that we can be copying these gestures from the Okay, so let me just spend a little bit of time um, trying to explore what the conditions are that allow the gesture to become like since it clearly doesn't have to, as it's illustrated by moms. So our hypothesis was that when gesture, it's only when gesture assumes the full burden of communication that it will look like language. In a sense, what we want to do for the mothers is just tell them to shut up. If they keep their mouths shut, so they have to rely exclusively on gesture, let's see what will happen in terms of the gesture system. So that's what we did. Did this work with David McNeil and Jenny Singleton. And we put speakers in a situation where they had to use their gestures and not their mouths. So we took in, in, hearing English speakers. That we asked them to describe a series of scenes in speech. These are the little vignettes that uh, Sapala and Newport used to um, explore ASL. And then we had them go through the scenes again. And 
describe it only with um, gesture. And then we come here. So here's an example of one of the scenes. Um, and here's an example of a hearing college sophomore at the University of Chicago just describing it. So watch him and his gestures. Gestures look a lot like the first girl I showed you. They're sloppy, gooky, it's hard to put them into back bins. They're sort of mushy. Now look what happens when you. Sitting there working in her paper and trying not to interact. 
as best we could with the other. And the only other one is the So this SIV order, interestingly, <coughs> it's not a start only to say it's even the first order that came about, but that's a pretty controversial thing. What isn't controversial it is definitely the order that the um, Wendy Sandler and company are finding for ABSL, a sign language that's growing up in uh, Israel. So it's sort of intriguing that it's the first, that it's the order that we're finding for them. Um, and then, of course, the interesting question is, if it's so natural, why don't we all use it? What's, why why do we ever pull away from SOV? Which is really a good question, which I have no answer not. Um, but one thought, maybe, you know, it's a natural way to, for people to represent events, but, but language does a lot of different things. So as it pulls away from these events, First of all, it, it, it itself can be a little ambiguous um, because you're showing the S and the B, the, sorry, the S and the O together. Um, and it's fine if you're having Captain swing tails, but what happens if you're having Joe kick the Charlie? Then they might be a little less distinguished. And in fact, some people have recently uh, done, they've replicated these data in the sense, the sense that SOB keeps cropping up over and over again, but you can find conditions under which you pull away from SOB. So when you're describing reverse bends, Bayer and take it to their show that you pull away from that, you tend to actually go to either SVO or your spoken language. It's hard to tell you that I've got. And describing complex events like the man tells the child that the girl catches the fish, you also pull away from SOV and what you want to see. So when called upon to take over the entire community with burden, gesture assumes a language on the form. And interestingly, although I said at the very beginning that you would take on, you would create this language in the, the form of the language that you have, not necessarily, not entirely. It really looks like you don't borrow it from the spoken language, even if you have it. Okay, so just but one more interesting point that I want to make is when gesture is used without speech, it immediately takes on this language structure. So it's not like these guys have to figure out a word order in their trial and error. Right away, they pick the hearing people. They picked up a word in an order and they used it throughout the entire experimental session. So the sentence-like structure came right away. But the morphological structure, which we did actually look for in their data, is not there right away. We, we haven't found it yet in hearing adults. So what hearing adults tend to do is either they use one gesture, one head shape for everything, so indiscriminate, or they vary their hands so that it takes on the properties of that particular captain or that particular airplane. So it's not categorical in any way at all. So, so the sentence-like stuff is right there. The morphological stuff Maybe adults can't do it so well, um, or at least they need more time to do it. Okay, so just to summarize, gestures versatile in form and function. It assumes this unsegmented and imagistic form when it works together with speech. That's co-speech gesture. But what it, it assumes this more segmented and language-like form when it takes on the functions, and that's really home sign. But what's sort of interesting is that co-speech gesture is the input to home sign. And that's sort of the point that I really want to drive home. So it suggests that these kids are categorically changing the gestures that they see. So that so the final question I just want to think about, and this will actually lead into some of the stuff that you hear in Marie, we'll be talking about tomorrow. How far can a child go in creating language? These kids have not, you know, great beat is not going to do it all. It's, it's a little limiting. So how far can they go? I think it's interesting to ask not what, they can, they can certainly do some, but where they fall off and what they fall off with respect to is really pretty interesting to ask as well. So, um, we're starting to look, Marie and Annie Sanks and I, in comparison to the American Sign Language, to try to compare systematically the groups that are there. So we can take child home signers and look at them in Nicaragua. We don't expect any differences. There might be some for cultural reasons, but we'll find out. But our assumption is that the child home signers are going to look roughly the same. We can then compare those child home signers to people that Marie has been following, adult home signers. In America, you never end up using your home sign system for your entire life. Something always happens. You learn sign language. You never get that. But in Nicaragua, you do it. We're just been following them for a long time. So when, when kids don't do something in their home sign, maybe they can do it because they're kids. They're just too young to be able to do it. It takes more maturity, it needs a good life on the planet, whatever. So this comparison will sort of give us some sense of the effective age. But what's, what's interesting to me also about what happens in homework one, these child home signers I find very interesting because they have this very weird situation. They're putting out this stuff that's language like what it's home sign. But they're getting in gesture. It's a productive system, and it's not a comprehension system. That's weird. That's really weird. I mean, no language-like system is like that. You put out one thing, and you get, I mean, I suppose if you talk German, you get that French, something like that. But you know, 
and not even because they're not even getting that in a language system. So it's not a, produ a receiver producer system. <coughs> that is definitely what's at least starting to happen in COMA 1. I mean, it, it, there may not be perfect, and any scientist has some results suggesting it's not perfect yet, but it's at least you're becoming both a producer and a receiver. So we, and I would think that would have a big impact on what your language can and does do. So we'll try to explore that. And then finally, the stuff that Eddie has been looking at, the effect of, of a fresh mind, you know, a baby coming in and looking at all of this stuff and then being organizing it, which is what they're showing you. Okay. So, what, in sum, home sign gestures tell us which aspects of language children can create in the absence of a language model, and in this sense, perform uh, providing behavior. Uh, I just want to thank my collaborators.